Welcome to NFL Imperialism. You may have seen this concept floating around YouTube, but I wanted to put my own spin on it and hopefully improve it. Before we get started, I humbly ask that you take a moment to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification button. This is going to be a series, and this channel has some other videos as well, sports related, entertainment related. We do a lot here, trying to grow the audience. We appreciate the fact that you're here right now. We ask that you continue to stay with us. Please subscribe to the channel. Thank you. If you're interested in a full, thorough breakdown of how this imperialism works, please check out the first three minutes or so of the 1966 video, which is linked in the description below. Otherwise, we are ready to start. Today, we're going to tackle the year 1967. The NFL and AFL are still separate leagues, but the league is growing as well. The New Orleans Saints are joining the league this year. The Green Bay Packers repeated as Super Bowl champions, winning Super Bowl II over the Oakland Raiders, who will emerge as the imperialism champions. Looking at the top five here, it's interesting to note that the Packers, the champions of 1967, only rank fourth, while the team they defeated in the Super Bowl, the Raiders, rank first. Additionally, the Rams and the Colts, both NFL teams, are also ahead of the Packers. And we take a look at the Saints as an expansion team at number three, ahead of last year's two expansion teams, Miami and Atlanta. But only the wheel, the arrow, and the games will tell us what's going to happen. Let's get to it. We're going to kick off 1967 with a nice big spin of the wheel. That's going to land us on the Saints. Welcome aboard the expansion team that's heading to the west. The Saints are going to open up their existence at Houston against the Oilers. We're tied at seven in the third quarter. That's Oilers quarterback Pete Bethard trying to dump it off to Hoyle Granger. He's more of a runner than a receiver. It gets picked off and running it into the end zone is corner Dave Witzel. This is actually his second interception of the game. This will put the Saints on top 14-7. They add on a field goal. The Oilers score late, but it's not enough. The Saints, in their inaugural season, get picked first at Imperialism, go on the road, and beat the Oilers. They will take over the southeastern part of Texas and expand their land. One team down, several, several more to go. The wheel is going to give us the Miami Dolphins, and it's likely they're going to be facing Atlanta. Yep, going northwest, landing right in the state of Georgia. Falcons, Dolphins, here we go. The Dolphins trail in the fourth quarter, facing a third and 12. That's Bob Greasy firing across the middle to Howard Twilley. He makes the catch, escapes the defender. That's going to temporarily tie the game at 13. The extra point's going to put him up. And this was the momentum that Miami needed. They actually took complete control in the fourth quarter, win the game 28-13. They will take over the land held by the Atlanta Falcons. And just like in last year's imperialism, the Dolphins are going to find themselves in isolation for at least, I would say, a significant amount of time. Let's give this wheel another whirl. It is going to be landing on the Patriots. Arrow is going to take them slightly northeast. And the Patriots, as usual, are going to expand before they play. That's the state of New Hampshire. The Patriots' land just got a little bigger. We're going to give it another try here. And it looks like it's going to not hit the Patriots again. It's going to slide past them into the Raiders. Arrow is going to take them slightly to the northeast. They're going to go to San Francisco in a rematch of our first game from 1966 Imperialism. Here we go. The Raiders are clinging to a 7-3 lead here in the fourth quarter, but they're on the doorstep of the end zone. That's Clem Daniels catching the swing pass from Daryl LaMonica, gets away from the defense, gets into the end zone. 14-3 here after the extra point. The 49ers are going to try to make a comeback here, though. This is John Brody. He's got some pressure in his face. He fires. That's intercepted. That's Kent McLuhan. I don't think they're going to catch him. This is going to be another touchdown. The Raiders extend their lead. It was a close 7-3 game, and all of a sudden now, it's 21-3. The 49ers tacked one on late to no avail. Your final score, Oakland 21, 
San Francisco 9. Northern California now will belong to the Raiders. The 49ers leave the game. The Raiders expand their land. Next round, next spin. The wheel is going to just creep past the Browns and get into the Redskins. The arrow is going to go to the west. That is going to give them the state of Virginia. So the Redskins territory gets much, much bigger. We're going to be looking for a game here. The wheel will choose the Bills. There is some chance for expansion. Arrow goes to the southeast. That is actually going to miss the Patriots land and hit Connecticut. So the Bills land gets bigger and the Patriots get covered up just a little bit more. Let's try one more time, see if we can't get a game going. That's the Bills again. The arrow is going to take them to the southwest this time. That's just enough to catch the Eagles territory. Bills at Eagles. Let's go. We've got a tie ball game, 17-17 in the fourth quarter. The Eagles do a play action. Norm Sneed, that's a leaping catch. What a play there by Ben Hawkins to get into the end zone. That is 34 yards. The Eagles tack on a field goal to come away with a 27-17 victory. The Eagles defend their land, take Buffalo's territory, and expand their own territory. A little bit more expansion than we're used to this early on. Let's see if that trend continues. The Chargers get called up. They will go southeast. That's going to take them into Arizona. So just like last season, they leave the California borders and expand their territory. We give it another spin. The wheel will select the Pittsburgh Steelers. The arrow will take them to the southwest. That's going to be another expansion. The Steelers are going to head into West Virginia. And now the Northeast is getting pretty crowded. Perhaps the third time to charm in finding a game. That will land on the St. Louis Cardinals. The arrow goes to the Northwest, but given their proximity within the state of Missouri, that's going to hit the Chiefs. Cardinals and Chiefs, the Battle of Missouri is on. The Chiefs offense hasn't been able to really get on track today, but here they are down 13-7. Less than two minutes to go. Len Dawson finds Chris Burford, makes a diving touchdown reception. What a play. Extra point gives the Chiefs a lead, 14-13. The Cardinals now, 4th and 13. Desperation throw to Johnny Rowland is incomplete. The Chiefs tack on a touchdown. Cardinals have one more chance. And this ball is going deep, and it's going to be picked off by Willie Mitchell. The Chiefs struggled, but they win the game, 21-13. And with that victory, the Cardinals are now eliminated from 1967 imperialism, and the Chiefs have complete control over the state of Missouri. Five teams have now been eliminated in 1967. We'll see if we get another one soon. That's going to land on the Eagles. The arrow is going to take them basically straight south. That's going to bypass all those teams to their side and hit Maryland. That's going to send them to face the Colts. Rather shockingly, the Eagles lead 28-27 in the fourth. They have the ball. This is an important third down. The pass goes to Gary Ballman. He makes a diving reception. His first catch of the game, it seals the deal. The Eagles go into Baltimore, the number three ranked team, and win 28-27. Now, the Eagles aren't picking up a whole lot of land, Maryland not being the biggest state. But it's a massive victory in other ways, and the Eagles move on. Right back to the wheel we head. Got a nice big spin out of this one. That's going to land on the Rams. The arrow is going to take them to the northeast. That is going to catch the southeastern corner of the Raiders' territory. We're going to have that game right now. We're in the midst of another upset here. The Rams have the ball at the one-yard line, up 14-0. They tack on another touchdown here. This is fullback Dick Bass getting in there. It's 21-0. They're actually going to add another touchdown before the end of the game. The number one team in our rankings, the Oakland Raiders, at home are shut out. 28-0 by the Rams. A combination of the Rams' running game 
and their incredible, fearsome, foursome defense led the way. The Raiders are out of this, and the Rams now take over the majority of California and look to be a player going forward. The wheel's been giving us some games. Let's see if it wants to give us another one. This is going to get right past the Patriots and go to the Browns. This is the last season they'll have Ohio to themselves. Slightly northwest, enough to hit the state of Michigan. The Browns will travel to Detroit to take on the Lions. We've got a tight one here. The Browns have been held to field goals all day. Trail 14-9. Frank Ryan drops back. And that's Paul Warfield getting away from his defender. And he gets taken down at the 6-yard line. They're finally knocking on the door. One play later here, they're going to be second and goal from the one inside the one. The handoff to Larry Conjar in for the injured Ernie Green. The Browns finally cross the end zone. They go up 16-14 with the extra point. They add another field goal. It's 19-14. One second left. The Lions have one last chance. The pressure's coming. That's a short pass to Gail Codgill. It's not going to go anywhere. That's a final, folks. The Browns head into Detroit, win the game 19-14. They now extend their land, leaving the state of Ohio's borders, entering Michigan's and taking over the state. The field continues to narrow as the wheel brings us the Broncos. That's almost a guaranteed expansion here after a big run of games. Southwest could have hit that corner of Arizona, but it really grabs New Mexico. Therefore, the Broncos will expand their land but lose their isolationism. Around we go again, and these back-to-back -back colors on the wheel are weird. Can't figure that out. The wheel chooses the Browns, heading toward the southwest that is easily going into the state of Indiana, and after defeating the Lions, the Browns will now just get a territorial expansion. We're left wanting for a game again, and again the wheel is drawn to the double color. It stays in the first flank, though. That's the Giants. Arrow takes them just about north, and that is going to easily hit the territory of the Eagles. An old-school NFC East game. Giants and Eagles. The Giants, with their new quarterback, Fran Tarkenton, are having no problem getting through the Eagles. They lead 34-17. This is a little screen pass to Ernie Coy. He gets around the defense. He just keeps going, and he's going to score a touchdown. That's going to make it 40-17. to This extra point's going to make it 41-17. I somehow lost the final screen here with the scoreboard. We're going to leave it here. This was the final score. And that jumbled up Northeast is starting to congeal with some of these teams getting eliminated. The Giants will take over the Eagles' territory and expand their land. Ten teams have been eliminated and 15 remain. The wheel will land on the Patriots. The arrow will go west, slightly southwest, just Southwest enough to hit that big territory that the Giants now have. So we're going to get a matchup between the Patriots and the Giants in New Jersey. Patriots lead 17-13 in the fourth. The Giants are going to try to force a field goal. They bring up the defense. Patriots audible into a pass. Bay Perilli throws to Gino Capaletti. He extends with the catch. Gets into the end zone for the touchdown. 24-13. Very late, the Giants score. Here they try the onside kick, and the Patriots recover, and they're going to win the game 24-19. A bit of an upset here after the Giants took care of the Eagles so easily, and now the Northeast is starting to congeal again. The Patriots will take over the Giants' land, and in the Northeast will be the biggest team. So I made a little boo-boo on the last one. There are now 10 teams eliminated and 15 remaining. The wheel just gets past the Chiefs into the Redskins. And the arrow goes into the Northeast. That's just enough there for that to enter the Patriots' territory. And just as before where the Giants went on the road and won and then hosted a game, the Patriots then went on the road and are now hosting a game. Will they meet the same fate as the Giants? Let's find out. We enter the fourth quarter with the Redskins on the one-yard line and down seven. The handoff is to 80 Whitfield, and just like that, we're going to have a tie game. The extra point's going to be good. It is 10-10. The Patriots now coming out looking for a response. 
Quarterback Bay Perilli drops back to pass, fires into a crowd. That's intercepted by Jim Shorter. Wow, the Patriots are giving this game away. First play on offense for the Redskins is a play action, and that is John Love breaking free. Makes the good catch there. That's a 44-yard gain. One play later, it's second and goal from the two. The pitch goes to Bobby Mitchell, and he dives for the end zone but comes up short, so third down. They're going to now do the same play, the pitch to Mitchell. He dives and comes up short, just running in, but fourth and one. They hand off to Whitfield, and that is about the most spectacular one-yard play you're ever going to see. Stop dead to rights, but he spun it in and got in for the touchdown. Washington now leads 17-10. Patriots come back, though. A lot of changes at the line here, audibles. And the handoff to Nance is botched as a fumble. Oh, my. This looks to be all over now. The uh, Redskins have the ball, but the Patriots do force a punt. They really only have one chance here. They send some rushers, and they block the punt. Oh, wonderful. They now have 35, uh, 35 seconds to go 49 yards. What are they going to do? Are they going to go straight for the end zone now? Let's see. It's going to be a run to Jim Nance. Interesting. He gets a lot of yards, though. That sets him up for an easier play, an 18-yard run there. Here it is, the next play. And they're going to run it again. No, it's a flea flicker. The throw to the end zone as time expires is perfect. Oh, my goodness. What a throw by Bay Perilli. That is Art Graham making the catch. That ball couldn't be a millimeter off. Here's the extra point to force overtime. And it's good. So we are going to be going to overtime. This game took a second to get started, but once it did... It got a little crazy. It's 17-17. Washington is going to win the overtime coin toss. So here we go from the 26-yard line. It's play action. What a de great deceptive play there on third and 13 to pick up the first down. That is once again John Love from the 46 now. Play action again. This time Love just takes off, and here's the throw. He makes a great catch. It's almost a carbon copy of the play that got them in position for their first touchdown. They're not wasting any time. Here comes kicker Gene Mingo. Oh, he makes it. Oh, he's not exactly a stellar kicker. That wasn't exactly a stellar kick, but it wins the game. Wow. Washington wins in overtime, 20-17 to in a wild and wacky affair. But they get the job done in the end. So taking a look at the map now, the Patriots, they had a good run, but they are out. And Washington now owns this weird-looking piece of land. But most importantly to them, they have survived and advanced. After all that craziness, we're going back to the wheel. And it's going to choose the Jets. They're going to play the Redskins or expand. Arrow goes straight north. They're going to expand. The Redskins just won that nutty game against the Patriots. Now they've got to take on the Jets at home. Late in the third quarter, the Jets lead 16-14. Redskins have the ball. The Jets break through the line. That's a forced fumble by Paul Rochester. That's Al Atkinson picking it up in the end zone for the touchdown. Easy does it. The Jets lead 23-14. Here in the fourth quarter, the Redskins get the ball. It's fourth and three. They're going for it. The handoff to Bobby Mitchell, and he gets stymied. Oh boy, on the very next play now, the Jets, they're going to go for the kill shot. Joe Namath throws it to the end zone to George Sauer, and it's picked off. That is Brig Owens making a huge play. The Redskins have life. They drive the ball down the field to the 21-22 yard line. Sonny Jurgensen back to pass, throws to Charlie Taylor, makes a diving catch in the end zone. That is spectacular. It is 23 to 20. Out comes Gene, Gene Mingo for the extra point. They bring a rush and he misses. Oh my goodness. Instead of being down two, they're down three. They're going to try for the onside kick. 
This is about their only chance. They recover. It doesn't go well, though. It's 4th and 33. They got knocked back 23 yards. Jurgensen fires to John Love. They pick up the first down. 39 yards from 4th and 33. Here on 3rd and 10 now, the Jets back up the defense. Jurgensen throws to Taylor. It's incomplete. So Gene Mingo, who just missed the extra point, has to kick a 52 yard field goal does he have the leg he does it's good oh my goodness he misses the extra point but hits the field goal tied at 23 now going to overtime third and one Jurgensen's gonna throw he's got all day he throws to love it's incomplete can Gene Mingo who missed the extra point come out here and give the Redskins back to back overtime victories this is going to be from 44 yards away. Lines it up, kicks up, and he made it, y'all. That is two weeks in a row. The Redskins have won a game in overtime with a field goal. They might just be a team of destiny here in this 1967 imperialism. Wow. So looking at the map, it's actually a very, very small gain here. The southern part of New Jersey goes to the Redskins, but again, they might be a team of destiny, and they're in control of the Northeast right now. After back-to-back -back overtime games, we almost need a breather here. Oh, it almost hit the Redskins again. That's going to the Dolphins. That's a guaranteed expansion. It's going slightly northeast. That's going to be South Carolina. Miami gets a little bigger. We'll try spinning the wheel one more time. It's going to give us the Rams. And the arrow is going to head toward the northeast. That's another expansion. The Rams will go into Nevada and begin maybe starting to control the west coast. A third shot at the wheel in this particular round. It will land on the Cleveland Browns. The arrow is going to head to the southwest. That's going to take them into Illinois. So we're going to be getting a game here. The Cleveland Browns at the Chicago Bears. A bit more straightforward in this game. The Browns have a two-touchdown lead here in the third quarter. The handoff goes to Ernie Green, spins around the defender, and gets into the end zone. The Browns will be taking a 35-14 lead here. And they're going to win it with a final score of 45-20. So after a couple of overtime games, this one was pretty simple. The Browns' invasion into Illinois is successful. And they are becoming a bit more of a presence here in the Midwest. More than half the teams have now been eliminated, and the wheel is going to give us the New, or that's it, the New Orleans Saints. And the arrow is going to take them into the West. The Saints went in and beat the Oilers. Now they have to go in and beat the Cowboys. That's a whole different ball of wax. Let's see if they can pull off the major upsets. They cannot. The game was reasonably close at halftime, 13-7, but the Cowboys explode for five second half touchdowns, winning the game handily, 48 to seven. Well, the Saints are an expansion team and the Cowboys are one of the better teams in football during this era. Not a big surprise that the Cowboys would win this game, take over the state of Louisiana, expanding their territory. Onwards we go. We will be taking into account here the San Diego Chargers. They will be heading toward the southeast. That's just going to hit. They're, they're the bottom left corner of New Mexico, which is occupied by the Broncos. That's going to be our next game. We're in the fourth quarter. The Chargers lead 17-10. It's pretty late. The pitch goes to running back Brad Hubbard. Not a whole lot of speed here, but power. He gets it into the end zone. That's going to put the game Away for the Chargers, there's not enough time for the Broncos to make any kind of realistic comeback. 24-10 is our final score. And now the Chargers have a decent looking amount of land here, stretching from Southern California all the way through Colorado. And in doing so, they knock the Broncos out of the game. Ten teams remain in the chase for the Imperialism Championship. The wheel will choose the Dallas Cowboys. The arrow is going to take them dead east. That's going to actually put them into the state of Mississippi. So the Cowboys are expanding east 
and expand their land. We haven't heard at all from the Packers or Vikings. Might that change? Nope. The passes the Packers goes in. Well, yep. It stays with the Chiefs. Barely. And they're going to go slightly to the northwest from the center of the logo. That's going to catch the state of Kansas. So Kansas City now has Missouri and Kansas. The third time has often been the charm for finding a game after a couple of expansions. This is another close call on the wheel. It's going to stay in the Redskins. The arrow is going to go to the southwest. That creates a photo finish. You will see that arrow is just clipping the eastern corner of West Virginia, which of course is under Steeler control. So we've got a game. The Redskins will be at the Steelers. Can the Redskins continue to be a team of destiny? In a word, yes. Pittsburgh staged a mini rally in the third quarter, but Washington took control of the game again in the fourth. This is Bobby Mitchell around the left end, untouched, 11 yards for the touchdown. It's going to put the Redskins on top, 33-14 to after the extra point. They tack one on late as well. Final score, 40-14 to on the road. I guess the Redskins could have used an easier game after two back-to-back -back overtime thrillers. So now the Northeast, outside of unclaimed territories, unequivocally belongs to Washington as they take Pittsburgh out of the map and bring us down to nine teams. Eight games remain to determine the 1967 Imperialism Champion, and for the first time we get the Vikings. The arrow is going to take them due south, so the Vikings won't have to play a game. They are going to be taking the state of Iowa and expanding their land. Let's give the wheel here another spin. And that is landing directly on the Cleveland Browns. No question about that. Arrow's going to take them slightly to the southeast. Also no question here. The Browns are going to be expanding into the state of Kentucky. We're going to see if the third time's a charm once again. The wheel is going to pass the Browns. And for the first time, is going to pick the Packers. Arrow heads to the southeast. Now that's going to hit Lake Michigan, but cross over into the Browns' territory. And as the Browns and Packers are border territories at the moment, that's going to give us a game. The Packers, of course, are Super Bowl II champions and defending imperialism champions. Let's see how they fare here. The Browns are controlling this game, up 17-6 in the second quarter. Shotgun snap to Frank Ryan. He holds it and he fires to Gary Collins wide open. Inside the 20, oh, he can't quite get into the end zone, taken down at the inch line. Leroy Kelly will punch it in on the next play. The Browns, they're at home, but they're facing the champs. They lead 24-6. This was enough of a cushion. The Browns took this game 30-16, eliminating the champions. So now looking at the map here, the Browns are going to take over the state of Wisconsin. But the bigger note here is not only are the defending champions out, but the number one ranked Raiders were eliminated earlier. So we're going to get somewhat of an underdog imperialism champion here in 1967. Closer we get to the end, the wheel will choose the Dolphins. This is a guaranteed expansion and a guaranteed end of their isolationism. That's going north. It's going to hit North Carolina. And that now puts them in contact with the team that is potentially the team of destiny here, the Washington Redskins. Right back at your wheel, it's going to choose for us the LA Rams. And the arrows going southeast, and with that expansion into Nevada, that is clearly hitting the Chargers territory. We're going to get the last two West Coast teams out on the field. The Chargers are defending their territory, leading by three in the third, inside the 50-yard line. The pressure comes, forces an overthrow. That's intercepted by Eddie Metter, and he just keeps going. He had the power to get through that first tackle, the speed to get away from everybody else. This is a spectacular pick six that completely turns this game on its head. The Rams take the lead. They add on another touchdown. They're up 24-13 now. Under the two-minute warning, the Chargers' John Hadle drops back, fires a perfect, perfect pass. That is Lance Allworth, an all-time great AFL wide receiver in the Hall of Fame. Chargers get the ball back here. Unfortunately, the AI in this game didn't know to go for two right there. They're down by four. Hadle throws to Gary Garrison. Well covered, but a great catch. 
The Chargers, they would be in field goal range, but they're down four. Here on the next play, they have a play action. The throw goes to Brad Hubbard, another pinpoint pass. The Chargers are going to try to win this with a touchdown. Maybe they know what they're doing here. One play later on second down. Hadel, the line holds up pretty decent. The throw to Garrison in the end zone. He dropped it. Oh my goodness, he dropped it. Well, it's third down. Drops back. He's got the tight end, but he's going for the end zone to Allworth. It's well covered, incomplete. Time expires. The Chargers let that one slip away, no question. The Rams should consider themselves very lucky to escape this game with the victory. And now they are indeed the final West Coast team remaining. They pick up a good chunk of land from the Chargers and are in good shape to be there at the end. We continue to whittle these teams down and with the latest spin of the wheel, that is going to stay with the Browns. Arrow is going to head to the Northwest. That will bring the Minnesota Vikings onto the field and now every team in 1967 will have played at least one game. The Vikings are going to host the Browns for control of the Midwest. We've got an interesting score here. Cleveland leads 20 to 11. Frank Ryan drops back to pass, looking for Paul Warfield. Beats the defender, makes the catch, gets into the end zone for the touchdown. That was a nice little 34-yard gain. That's all the Browns needed. 27-11. Not a score you see every day in the NFL. The Browns win. The Vikings' first and only foray into 1967 does not go well. They cannot defend their land. Cleveland takes it over and is now the true dominant team in the Midwest. Six teams remain, and really outside of the Dolphins, probably everyone's got a chance to win this thing. The Cowboys are called up by the wheel. Arrow takes them to the Northeast. That's just going to be a simple expansion right there into the state of Arkansas. The Cowboys get a little bigger, and now they touch the Chiefs. Here we go again with the old wheel. It will land on the Los Angeles Rams. Arrow goes to the Northeast. Now look at this. That arrow, it looks like it's hitting Utah. In reality, because we needed to show the distance between the Rams logo and now this is the state of Nebraska, the arrow is much thicker than it normally would be. In reality, it passes Utah, hits Nebraska for a very odd looking expansion, but that's exactly what's going on here. The Rams take over Nebraska. Gonna be hoping for something a little less complicated this time around. The wheel is gonna pass. The Redskins hit the Cowboys. And it's going to go northeast, just northeast enough to miss the edge of Oklahoma there and go into the Chiefs' territory. That's going to be our game, the Cowboys at the Chiefs. The Chiefs are looking great here in the third quarter, holding the Cowboys to a field goal attempt in the red zone. Danny Villanueva, you always got to make it adventurous. He makes the kick, they close it to within 17-10. Here is the ensuing kickoff. The Chiefs, Emmett Thomas receives at the two-yard line, gets around a couple of blocks, looks like he might be doing, nope, he looked like he had a chance to go somewhere with that, but he fumbles instead. The Cowboys recover the very next play on offense, they pick up the brush, that's a touchdown pass to Bullet Bob Hayes, it went from a 10-point deficit to a tie game in three plays, 17-all, here's the Chiefs' response. Coming from the 36, play action, Len Dawson rolls, throws into a crowd, Cornell Green picks it off at the 49-yard line. Oh, he's gone. Oh, this would be a touchdown from 149 yards. What a turnaround, right on a dime. The Cowboys down 10, all of a sudden up 7, and their defense is now inspired. They're forcing a punt. Gerald Wilson gets it blocked. 1967 is the year of blocked punts. Chuck Howley scoops it up for the vaunted zero-yard touchdown. The Chiefs have completely fallen apart here. A fumble, a pick six, a blocked punt. 24 points in the third quarter. The Chiefs tack one on late. It didn't matter. The Cowboys win 31-24. And while the Chiefs are one of the better teams of the AFL during this era, they simply couldn't stand up to the heat of the Cowboys. So the Cowboys take over the land and they've got a really truly funny looking 
piece of land here, you almost want them to pick up the state of Oklahoma now so that it can look a little bit more reasonable. But all that said, Dallas wins. We are down to our final five teams. And from that five, we shall now select our next team. It's the Rams. And the arrow's going to take them northeast again. And that's going to be another expansion to a kind of weird-looking spot. They're going to take over South Dakota. They started from Los Angeles. They've now reached South Dakota. The Rams' land gets bigger. We spin the wheel again until we get a game. And the Rams are spared this time. That's going to the Dolphins. They're either going to have to go to Washington or expand. They're going to Washington. So the Dolphins have beaten the Falcons. Stayed in isolation for a while. Have made it to the Final Five. They've now got to travel to face a hot Redskins team. Like a good boxer, the Redskins have kept the Dolphins at bay with jabs. This is a pitch to Bobby Mitchell. He makes that, That's a nice run. Ran into his own guy and then gets to the outside, gets into the end zone. The Redskins didn't run away with this one, but they were never threatened either. A 23-7 final score. The Dolphins did what they could. They lasted as long as they could. But the Eastern Seaboard, with the acquisition of the Dolphins' territory now belongs to the Redskins. We are down to the final four. This is now truly anybody's ball game. Any of these would be worthy imperialism champions. The Redskins might be the favorite. The arrow is going to take them northeast, so a very small expansion here into the state of Vermont. We ought to mention these are all NFL teams left. The AFL is completely eliminated. The wheel chooses the Cowboys. The arrow is going to go north, slightly northeast, and look at that. It just misses Tennessee. That means the Browns have to now defend their territory against the Cowboys. Sorry to say this is a bit of a lackluster game. It's 7-7 in the third quarter. The Cowboys pitch it to Walt Garrison. He gets past a diving tackle attempt, gets into the end zone. That's going to make it 14-7. After both teams exchange field goals at 17-10 now, the Browns have one chance from the 40-yard line. Frank Ryan drops back. He's probably looking for Paul Warfield. He does. It's overthrown. Time expires. Dallas goes into Cleveland. They grind it out. A 17-10 victory. And now the Cowboys own the center of the United States with the Redskins on the east and the Rams on the west. We're setting up for a grand finale. We've got a very quick expansion run to go through here. The Cowboys go to the Northwest. They take North Dakota. Once again, landing on the Cowboys, going to the Southwest. They finally get Oklahoma. And another one here that is just going to sneak back into the Cowboys. It's going to go Southeast, so the Cowboys take up Tennessee as well. Here is another spin. It's going to land on the Redskins. They do have a chance to expand, but we'll spin it. It goes to the Northwest. That takes them into Dallas's territory. So the Redskins will play the Cowboys, and that means that the Rams will play for the Imperialism Championship against the winner of this game. Dallas is once again showing off its chops as a second-half team. It's 7-6 to six here. That's play action. Don Meredith throws the Lance Rensel for the touchdown. The Cowboys were already in the lead. They extended a little bit further with the extra point. It is 14-6. The Cowboys get the ball back again at the 27. The pitch goes to Dan Reeves. He turns the corner and just outruns the defense, picks up a big block at the end. As time expires in the third quarter, the Cowboys score once again. They go up 21-6. And Washington's dream run in this imperialism comes to a crashing end. Dallas outscores them 24-0 in the second half to win 31-6. And now we have our championship game. The Dallas Cowboys will face off with the Los Angeles Rams. And the winner will be the champion of 1967 imperialism. All that's left to do now is spin the wheel to see who will be attacking. And it looks like it's going to be the Cowboys. So the game's going to take place in Los Angeles, where the Rams will be favored as the number two team coming into this season. 
Let's see how it shakes out. The teams exchanged field goals in the first half. This is Bruce Gossett making his kick for the Rams, giving them a 3-0 lead, and here's Danny Dillon to wave his 28-yarder. Dramatic as always, 3-3 at the half. The Rams in the second half have the ball at the 28-yard line. The handoff goes to fullback Dick Bass, and he drags a dude, drops a dude, gets into the end zone for the touchdown, the first touchdown of the game. 28 yards, the Rams lead. 10 to 3. Cowboys now have the ball. Don Meredith is taken down by Deacon Jones, but the bad news is he's injured and out. The Rams do get the ball back though. It's third and four. Les Josephson is stuffed. So from the 36, they're gonna go for it. On fourth and four. Too close to punt it, too far for a field goal. Let's see what they try here. They're going to try Josephson again. The Cowboys are up to the task. All righty. Now the Cowboys have the ball. 30-19 from the 30. The pass goes deep to Bob Hayes. They left him alone. Does he have the speed to get away from the defense? He does. Oh, my goodness. 70 yards on the touchdown from Don Meredith. It's 10-9. And you can guess probably why I'm showing the extra point here. The Rams charge through the line and block it, and they maintain the 10-9 lead. Now the Rams have the ball just inside the 40. Play action to Josephson. The pass goes to Jack Snow right on the button. That's 39 yards for the touchdown. It's the fourth quarter. The Rams will make the extra point. They lead 17-9. It's going to be tough for Dallas to come back here. From just outside of midfield, Meredith jogs back. The perfect crosser to, that is to Lance Renzel. I was going to say Bob Hayes again. He's doing everything. From the 19-yard line now, Meredith will drop back. Throws to the end zone. That's to Hayes. He leaps and makes the catch. His second touchdown of the game. That's going to make it 17-15. You would think the AI would know in this situation to go for two. Okay, they do. The Cowboys down two, 218 to go in the game. This to tie it up. They're in the T formation. The handoff to Don Perkins, he's stuffed. Oh, he's done this all season and he gets stuffed right there. The Rams have the ball just inside midfield, up two. That's play action. Looks like they're gonna go for the kill shot. It's over. Thrown. Bernie Casey's overthrown. Wow, the Cowboys will get it back. Play action. In comes Maxi Bond for the big hit. Takes him down for the sack. That'll make it third down and 12. Play action again. Here comes Bond again. Forced to throw. It's incomplete. So it's fourth and 12. This is it. This is the game for both the Rams and the Cowboys. Meredith drops back. That's Bob Hayes again. And look at that speed. You've got to be kidding me with this. He spins away and gets inside the 20 for a 65-yard gain. He has 154 yards on three plays that we've shown. Here's Villanueva from 35 yards. No drama here. Dallas takes the lead, 18-17. There's still some time, though. Here's the kickoff. Jack Snow is going to field it. It's a short kick. He is not going down. The clock continues to tick. He keeps going. He's down. That's it. Game's over. What a championship game here. The Cowboys go into Los Angeles, and Bob Hayes just goes bananas. The Cowboys win the game 18-17. The Cowboys are 1967 imperialism champions. Look at that star sitting on top of the whole United States. Looking back now at the real results of the 1967 season, unlike 1966, we had a totally different result. The Packers were winners in real life with the Raiders as runners-up. But here, we have the Cowboys coming in from outside the top five to win it, and the Rams, runners-up in the rankings, runners-up in imperialism. We want to take a look at the Cowboys roster here. Clearly, Bob Hayes was the star of the show in the championship game. A great offense and a great defense full of Hall of Famers and a lot of really good players that maybe should be there as well. Taking a quick look at the scores here from 1967, we can see that a lot of road teams won a lot of games. 
And going into the second half of the scores, you saw that the Cowboys won the last three games. And that reflects here in the 1967 record. Cowboys were 2-0, and reeled off those last three. They had the most wins in 1967, which makes sense. They were the champions. And now looking at the overall records, makes sense again that the Cowboys and Packers, which was the biggest rivalry of this era, both of them sit there at 8-1. and one. Given the nature of imperialism, only six teams have an overall winning record. And several teams, seven in fact, have yet to win a game, including, somewhat surprisingly, the Colts and the Vikings. That'll wrap things up for 1967 Imperialism. I thank you so much for watching. Please, if you can take a moment to like this video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, it would mean so very much. We are going to be coming out in a few days with 1968. For those of you who are watching this as it debuts, those of you who are watching later, every completed imperialism to date is linked in the description below. So give those a look as well. Thank you again. Let's take one more look at the United States of Blue. That is the Dallas Cowboys Lone Star sitting in the center. Thank you so very much once again. Have a great day and we'll catch you next time.